Lebanon um, in the fear of the moon bombing and, and all of the other interfering things that have happened since we all went into our homes and did everything in our country. Um, we've had a lot of webinars and we really need to do these We're trying to do midnight, um, which is a little bit more interactive. Um, we all have the ability to chat um, with each other and with the rest of the group um, over the, the group chat. Um, and you have control over your microphone. Um, Todd is helping me, so if anyone did that, you can then send me a question to Bob and use the cell phone. We can, we can turn that off, but um, you have control over your, your video and your microphone. So we can see you um, and we can hear you depending on what your settings are. So be aware. Um, but I'm hopeful. <laughs> Man, I'll <skip> it. <laughs> um, I'm hopeful that this leads to a little bit more of an informal and exciting and interesting conversation um, because the point of this is to have. Um, a real discussion about what it's like to own and operate uh, an electric vehicle here in the state of Maine. Um, and so uh, hopefully uh, we get a feel of uh, real experiences and we can answer your questions. Um, so the format, uh, so for folks who are just joining us too, as a reminder to um, go ahead and rank the first and last name. Um, you can do that. Um, on your picture that you see, you see your three little dots and your name, um, first and last name. Um, that will help Todd mm -hmm. in your Q&A section if you want to call mm -hmm. or you ask a question. Um, that way we can know who is on the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, So the format for tonight is um, I am going to give a brief presentation, um, just a little bit of the nuts and bolts of electric vehicles, um, Anastasia. But then hopefully the bulk of the day uh, is going to be answering people's questions. Um, and everyone who's registered for this webinar uh, gave us so many good questions. So we have a we have a lot of questions that we are going to try very hard to answer. Um, but if, as we're answering those questions, if you've already submitted, if you come up with a follow-up question, um, or we didn't get the question right, um, you can write it into the chat box, and Todd will call on you, and, uh, or I'll call on you, and we'll have you ask your question. Um, so hopefully we'll get everybody's questions answered, um, and we'll see how it goes. But just a reminder, this is not a normal webinar. Tesla Model 3 two years ago, and prior to that, since 2001, I had been, I started off in a, a Toyota Prius hybrid, then went into the plug-in hybrid. So, I kind of had uh, transitioned, and now, uh, I, as 
some have said, uh, you're right, I would not turn back. We have the, the money component of a car. People see the price tag of a new electric vehicle and think this isn't for me. Um, the real saving is in the fuel costs and the operation and maintenance costs. Um, even in these times when gas prices have plummeted, um, you can still get savings in your gasoline costs um, in driving an electric vehicle. So I pulled this off um, the Department of Energy's website um, it's based on the average price of gasoline here in the state of Maine uh, and comparing it to the average um, electricity cost of charging an electric vehicle. So there's a lot of averaging going on in these numbers um, and they're going to be specific, you know, each, each car and each circumstance are going to be slightly, slightly unique, but on average Maine's gasoline is $2.12 a gallon. Um, and when you translate that much power into charging your electric vehicle to drive that distance that your gasoline would take you, um, you're spending about $1.53 per, per e-gallon equivalent. Um, so even even with these low gas price days, you're still an electric, um, an electric car. 
Um, but it's not just the um, maintenance costs, and it's just not, not, not just the fuel costs, it's the maintenance costs as well. Um, you know, again, every electric vehicle is going to be different, but um, if you take out that in, internal combustion engine, suddenly you're no longer having to do those oil changes. Um, you know, all of those, those belts and things that wear out um, don't on electric cars. Your, your maintenance really is um, rotating your tires, checking your coolant, um, windshield washer fluid, um, air filters, a lot of smaller things, um, and they don't need to be checked quite as often. And so um, you're really saving a lot in maintenance costs um, and also just time and energy going to the gas station or going and getting your car serviced. Um, the, yeah. you know, I'm talking about an all electric if you have a hybrid, I drive a Prius Prime, so it's a, it's a plug-in. Um, it does have an electric battery, but I still need to do all of the maintenance um, with my engine that runs on gasoline. Um, so I don't get these lovely maintenance cost savings, um, but I do get to save on fuel, so that's nice. Um, so those are the driver owner benefits. Um, a surprising beneficiary of electric vehicles is actually the electric utilities and the utility customers. Um, it is uh, it is the unsung hero of the EV revolution. Um, so I apologize for this terrible slide and this terrible chart, but I think it's really important um, to understand that um, when we use our electric vehicles, we are plugging into the grid. Um, and lots of folks, I have a slide in a minute, about um, what that means for the environment. Um, but if you're charging your vehicle at night um, at your home, which is where most people are charging their vehicles, you are taking energy off the grid at a time when it is um, underused. And so our, our grid is, we're paying for a grid infrastructure that we're not fully utilizing. So suddenly we're, we're utilizing that grid. Um, so the utility is making more money, which averages over the entire uh, customer base to mean that we pay less um, for our energy infrastructure because we're using it more um, and we're distributing it at times when it's, it's underutilized, which is nighttime. Um, and so if you quantify up the benefits to the EV owners plus the benefits to the utility ratepayers and the benefits to society um, with really robust um, penetration of electric vehicles, you're seeing billions of dollars of um, benefits going back to society and the ratepayers. Um, so, you know, they have not, this is an MJ Bradley report from 2017, so they haven't done um, a report for our state. But if you look at Massachusetts or Connecticut, um, you know, by 2050, the benefits are, you know, 32 to $17 billion um, of, of savings. Um, so that's nothing to sneeze at. Um, and then, of course, society. Um, we all breathe the fumes from internal combustion engines. Um, we breathe them not just the ones that are being driven here in Maine, but the ones that are being driven all the way down the eastern coast. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really big contribution to Maine and the world's um, greenhouse gas load. Um, here in Maine, Transportation sector, which includes the driving of our, mostly the driving of our cars and trucks, is 54% of our um, greenhouse gas emissions. So over half of Maine's emissions comes from our cars and trucks. Um, we've done a good job reducing our emissions in other sectors, residential, commercial, industrial, electric utilities. We're doing, we need to do more. We're doing a good job, but we need to do more. Um, not so in transportation. We really haven't cracked this nut yet. And so we really need to tackle these emissions um, that have increased over time and are um, heavily contributing to our greenhouse gas emissions in the state. Um, again, uh, one of the questions that was submitted a number of times by folks registering for this webinar was, um, isn't this just shifting? Um, you know, we're, we're just plugging it in instead of putting gasoline in our engines and we're um, and so we're still emitting. And it's true, there are still emissions associated with pulling electricity off of our grid unless you have installed solar. Um, that is another calculation altogether. So if you combine electric vehicles with solar, you're, you're really hitting it out of the park. But even if you're just yeah. plugging it into the grid um, um, without any solar panels attached, 
um, in the state of Maine or in, in all of New England, we're part of the ISO New England grid. Um, we, uh, it's the equivalent of, of driving a vehicle that gets 114 miles per gallon. So that's fabulous. Um, plug it in, drive it, it's great. Um, of course, electric vehicles are not the, the silver bullet. They're not gonna be the only solution. We need to um, figure out a way to make our communities more walkable and bikeable and improve our um, public transportation systems. Um, and make it so that Maine is a place where people can live um, without having to be dependent on a vehicle. But for those of us who need a vehicle to get around um, or do special trips or, or um, get from point A to point B that there isn't public transportation um, or an easy way to walk or bike, um, plugging in an electric vehicle in our New England grid because of where we get our electricity is actually much better for the environment than um, continuing to um, put gasoline in the tank and burn it that way. Um, the other question is um, lithium, lithium ion batteries, um, don't they take so much more energy to produce? And so, you know, the, the harm is in the manufacturing. Um, it is true that the manufacturing of those batteries does take more greenhouse gas emissions to manufacture. So if you look at a car straight off the assembly line and you're comparing an internal combustion engine with an electric vehicle, um, that internal combustion engine is gonna have a slightly lower, slightly lower greenhouse gas profile. As soon as those rubber, the rubber hits the road and the car starts moving, that calculation starts changing quite quickly. And within six months to 18 months, depending on the size of the battery, um, that electric vehicle is um, is saving carbon emissions, even accounting for the additional emissions from the battery. So um, within a very short period of time, you are already saving on carbon emissions. Um, and in fact, the, the technology is moving so quickly and cars are becoming so much more efficient um, and batteries or technology is becoming so much better that um, the uh, that profile is changing sort of as we speak. But this is the most recent, um, this is the most recent calculation. So it's a 20, 2018 calculation. Um, and it, it still shows that there's there's quite quite a lot of gain. And it's true almost everywhere in the in the United States. There's a couple of places where where it's it's close. Um, but it's just about everywhere it's better to drive an electric vehicle than your internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, and just to make me fun, I want I took another um, another snapshot uh, just to show the local impacts. So you know this is another Union of Concerned Scientists blog where you can um, plug in your car. So if you're driving a Chevy Bolt in Bangor, um, it's a 2019. Um, it is uh, getting the equivalent of 129 miles per gallon just plugging into Maine's electrical grid. And that's fabulous. Um, so, you know, that's, that's that. I live in North Carolina and I drive a Prius Prime plug-in, um, which of course is, um, it only has about a 25 mile battery range, but even still, um, you know, I, I'm driving the equivalent of a car that gets about 80 miles per gallon, um, depending on how I drive it. In these pandemic times, my little tank tells me I'm getting 200 miles to the gallon, which makes me feel really good. <laughs> um, there a lot of another question and Anastasia and others can speak to this a little bit more in the Q&A portion, but we got lots and lots of questions about EVs and plug-in hybrids and what kind of options are available. Um, it is true that in the state, we've had a hard time getting a lot of a lot of vehicles. That has changed a lot because of the good work that everyone on the call has done and, and Efficiency Main Trust is doing to um, get more cars and more um, variety available um, and so this is just a this is just a general it's not what's available today in the state of Maine but um, I just pulled this up um, these are some of the all-electric models that are, are available in 2020 um, one of the one one person asked whether there was all-wheel drive available and there are some um, there's an Audi and a Jaguar and a BMW that has some um, all-wheel drive capabilities um, and then this is a, not a complete list, but a snapshot of some that are available in 2020. Um, 
And so there are cars that are available. More are coming available every year. Um, and it's driven in a lot because of just demand. Um, there's always the question about the trucks. Um, we've been waiting. We've seen the commercials of the, the truck towing the, the train. Um, there are um, there are trucks coming available. Um, hopefully this year, um, maybe next year, for some better variety. But just a couple. You know, everyone wonders about the Ford F-150. Um, they say Ford says it'll be available in 2022, um, and it's, that's the one that you see towing the train in the commercial. Um, GMC is is producing a Hummer in 2021. Um, and uh, they also are going to have an SUV and a, and a more traditional truck. Um, again, in 2021 or 2022, um, Tesla has their, their funny looking truck um, that they say will be available in 2022. Um, and that one should have a 250 to 500 mile range, depending on the size battery that you order. Um, and they, they're putting the price point for that one at around 40,000. So, there's there's lots of um, lots of work being done. Of course, it'd be great if we had more trucks available, but um, they are coming. Uh, so that was my. I'm trying to be quick so that we have time for Q and A. So I'm going to pass it over to Anastasia. I'm going to put myself on mute, and Anastasia, you take it away and just tell me when to um, when to advance your slides. Sure. Um, thanks, Sue, and thanks everyone for coming this evening. Um, Sue uh, covered a lot of good information that I also kind of have in my slides, so I think I'll be able to fly through. But if you could advance to the next slide, um, I'll do a quick introduction to the Efficiency Main Trust for those of you who don't know. Also, my name is Anastasia Hediger. Again, I'm a program manager at Efficiency Main. Um, I am currently um, overseeing the electric vehicle initiatives along with some other staff and uh, working on a lot of our other climate facing um, initiatives and programs. Um, Efficiency Maine runs the state's energy conservation programs, uh, primarily through rebates and incentives, as well as um, you know, our website, if you haven't been there yet, has a wealth of technical information on um, a lot of different technologies and programs. Um, we provide a network of trusted installers and vendors across the state to help um, implement a lot of these technologies. Um, we do a lot of research and evaluation on kind of what's next and um, what can save Mainers money and energy. Um, so that's kind of efficiency main in a nutshell. Um, next slide, please. And um, you can also flip to the next slide if, if you'd like, Sue. Um, Sue already showed this pie chart from the DEP, but that just illustrates how much of our state's emissions come from the transportation sector. And that's why we're all here today. Um, and promoting electric vehicles is um, one of the kind of first and foremost uh, solutions to kind of try to bring that wedge down. And that's what Efficiency Maine is focused on with our programs. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a short list of some of the primary barriers that um, we've observed and that um, other folks who are focused on the same goal um, have observed nationally and even internationally. Um, one of the kind of primary barriers that we're all aware of is the, that electric vehicles are often more expensive than the conventional internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, and the rebates that we offer, in addition to some other um, incentives uh, that I will talk about later, um, are there to help kind of reduce that barrier um, and actually make EVs more accessible than um, a lot of people think. Um, another barrier is um, known as range anxiety. That is kind of a term to describe the, the fear that your EV is going to run out of um, battery on the side of the road and then you're going to be stranded. Um, and that comes from sort of uh, the perception that EVs have a smaller range uh, than they actually do. And those ranges are expanding with every year, every model that comes out. Um, that range is kind of growing. Um, those numbers look like in a couple slides. Um, 
and then that also comes from a lack of awareness um, about public charging opportunities um, and quite literally a lack of public charging um, infrastructure and that's another part of Efficiency Maine's goal is to expand um, public charging infrastructure across the state in both urban and rural areas um, and I'll talk about that later as well. Um, as Sue kind of alluded to, dealers have had trouble getting EVs on the lots in previous years, but with the um, initiation of the rebate program last August, um, dealers are seeing a surge in demand for the vehicles and manufacturers are very responsive to that. And even anecdotally, we've heard from dealers that um, it's not nearly as hard as it used to be to get those vehicles on the lot. The time, um, the timeline for that has shrunken and de they've seen demand and interest from consumers um, rise pretty rapidly over the last uh, 10, 10, 11 months. Um, and then of course there's a need for more consumer awareness about the benefits that Sue just um, went through and the um, you know opportunities to charge in public and also at home and just how accessible all of this can be with um, public engagement and programs like um, what Efficiency Maine is doing. Um, next slide, please. So again, uh, the solution that we are focused on right now is to promote more EVs in Maine. Next slide, please. Um, and this table shows what uh, rebates we have available today. Um, primarily, these are instant rebates. So you go into one of our 48 participating dealerships all across the state and um, you don't have to bring anything with you or do any paperwork ahead of time. The dealer will uh, take care of that and instantly uh, discount um, whatever rebate amount you qualify for. Most individuals um, kind of fall into this first column of $2,000 for battery electric vehicles, which are all electric, no gasoline goes into those vehicles. Um, that rebate is a bit higher than the one for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Um, and then the second tier is uh, enhanced for qualifying low-income Mainers. Um, and then the third group is for governmental entities and tribal governments. And that's um, targeting fleets and municipalities um, as well as state government um, vehicles. Um, and then, like I said, a lot of most of the rebates that go through the program are in dealerships and those are instant rebates. Um, but in the case of Tesla right now, who doesn't have a registered uh, dealership in the state, you can order that car directly from the manufacturer online and apply for a mail-in rebate to Efficiency Main directly. And um, that rebate is $2,000, just like the other all-electric vehicles. Um, next slide, please. So this is a list of our current list of the all-electric vehicles that qualify for that $2,000 rebate um, or more. And um, most recently, we added the Tesla Model Y, the base model um, meets our criteria. Um, and these vehicles range, their ranges kind of vary, um, but a lot of different options um, to kind of meet, meet different uh, driving needs and um, sizes and things like that. Um, next slide, please. And I'll, I'll, I'll add that the range to those all electric vehicles can surpass um, 250 miles, um, approaching 300 miles. Um, and the smaller batteries can kind of go to about 100 miles, but even those models are advancing really rapidly. Um, and then this is our list of plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Um, the Toyota RAV4 Prime was just added this past week and we already had our first customer buy one. Um, so these, this list is also diversifying. It's not just the Prius Prime anymore. Um, and we're also seeing the emergence of some more crossover type vehicles on this list. Um, so as we were kind of talking about trucks before, um, crossovers, which are a little bit bigger, are entering the market and 
and that's an exciting next step. The ranges for these vehicles combined with their gasoline range can can go up to you know 600 miles. Um, so you get still a lot of fuel savings um, and emission savings with the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Um, next slide, please. And this is just a short list of some vehicles that are um, exciting and hitting the market soon. Um, Rivian and the Ford F-150 are getting a lot of um, excitement because of their um, size and truck capabilities. Um, and we're constantly looking um, to the market to, to see what's coming up next. Um, there are obviously others that aren't on this list that we're watching um, and we'll always be updating our list. So if you're thinking about it, I would definitely just keep your eyes peeled on our website. Um, and if you're wondering why something isn't on there or you see something that's that's that should qualify but um, isn't on our list, feel free to contact us and we can either explain why not or um, you know consider it um, to, to be on our list. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so these are the additional incentives I mentioned that can stack on top of our efficiency main rebates. One is the federal tax credit that can amount to um, $7,500 depending on the size of the battery and what um, make and model it is. Some manufacturers have already sold the maximum number of vehicles and those tax credits are done. But um, that is definitely something worth checking out and we have those amounts um, on our website for each of the vehicles. Um, and that that credit can stack on top of our rebate, um, even in a month-to-month -month payment for a lease. Um, there's also a federal tax credit for um, home charging stations and um, commercial charging stations at businesses. Um, and that runs through the end of 2020. That was extended. So um, worth checking out if you're interested in buying charging equipment. Um, and then lastly, most manufacturers offer their own rebates or discounts um, at some point or another, and those can be quite substantial. Um, so that's worth asking a dealer for what the most current deals are. Um, and I will roll to the next slide <laughs> um, to just run through what else we're working on. Um, the first three bullets describe our charging station initiatives. Um, to expand Maine's fast charging network, um, as well as our public two, our public level two charging network. Um, we have already kind of finished phase one and phase two, um, and those rounds of funding um, helped install public chargers across the state. And you can visit our website and plug share um, to, and also the uh, AFDC website to kind of check out a map with uh, those new locations, and we're expecting to release an RFP um, this fall for another round of funding for fast chargers um, across the state. And um, if you know someone who is who has a business or a property that might be a good candidate for that, um, definitely let them know. And um, you can contact me or Efficiency Maine for more information um, to be notified when that gets released. Um, there are also some pilot projects underway to uh, fund more public level two chargers, um, particularly um, you know in areas of the state that we haven't reached yet. Um, and then there's also an education pilot to kind of get more information about charging um, at home and in, pub in the public um, coming out with some videos and guidebooks. Um, and then lastly, we're doing an innovation pilot to investigate um, charging behavior and time of use rates to oh, kind man. of see what type of incentive um, and structure would um, encourage people to charge off at off-peak hours. Um, and maybe we can get into that in the questions. I don't want to take too much more time. Um, but that's kind of the suite of programs that we work on at Efficiency Maine. And I think that might be my last slide. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to chime in for questions later. All right. Um, there were some questions, Anastasia, that um, were popping up in the chat. I kind of think it might make sense to go to those quickly. 
um, before we jump into um, but I want to leave leave some question time. So um, one was um, and there's some good conversation happening too. Uh, so people are answering questions, um, which is I just learned that there's a medium sized size tractor in the works, um, which I didn't know. Um, but there was a question, Anastasia, about the federal tax credits um, and how they are reflected in leasing costs. Do you know how that works? Um, I, I, I don't know actually how, I think it might depend dealer to dealer. Um, how you do it, and I don't know that you have to have all of those steps in place when you step into a dealership. Um, I think that's something that um, you can apply for, um, but that's, I'm actually not super familiar with the nuts and bolts of the federal tax credit, but I know that it can be um, incorporated into your monthly payments. I, think I, I can, yeah, I, uh, when I did my lease on my Kona in Bangor, um, they're the owner of the vehicle. They applied the $7,500 federal tax credit off of the price of the car. Um, so it's all taken care of when you initiate the lease, it drops your final price that you're essentially financing through the lease. Seems pretty, pretty nice and straightforward. Excellent. Um, and then Anastasia, there was also a question about the new Audi EV and whether or not that would be added to the list of cars. Um, I don't know if you've looked at that or not. I believe that Audi um, exceeds our price, our um, maximum price um, criteria, which is fifty thousand um, dollars. So I don't think that it would qualify for a rebate program, but I can double check that. Um, great. So I'm going to jump us right into the charging questions. Uh, so people asked so many questions and we're going to try to get to all of them. Um, but the, the questions ran the gamut from charging to specific questions about driving in cold climates, models and specs of different vehicles and um, the purchasing questions around the rebates um, to some really, really thoughtful environmental question. So I'm, I'm going to start us in charging uh, land. And one of the questions that we got a lot of is just the nuts and bolts of how folks um, manage their batteries and range. Um, how do you manage long distance trips? Um, and how long do charges last? Um, you know, what kind of range do you really need? And um, that's obviously going to depend on what your driving habits are. Um, but uh, I thought I would just pass that to Gordon um, and others to jump in and just talk about their, how they manage their range and battery issues. Um, well, I'll try and be brief and, and hopefully Fred and Paul can jump in. But uh, t to me, it was uh, simply a matter of planning. Um, any EV that you will get will have a sort of a nominal EPA range. Um, mine uh, was quoted at 258 miles on a full battery charge. Um, in winter, that'll be a little bit less for sure. If I use the heat, if I drive like a maniac, uh, no pun intended, um, it all sort of depends on what your vehicle uh, is capable of and your driving habits and terrain and weather and all those types of things. But I think that the key point is that you plan uh, virtually every EV owner that I'm aware of has several apps on their phone or within the vehicle itself that are locator apps. They will uh, identify where charging stations are, um, what their types of plugs they are. If they're network stations, then you have to pay uh, you can also find out whether they're in use. In some cases, you can um, you can reserve a you know a slot. Um, the basic chargers that are out there in the public sphere are uh, not networked. Uh, so when you show up at uh, a location that you found on your app, you may find an EV or two uh, in a queue uh, or not. Um, that's all evolving and changing. Uh, there are more network chargers out there, but generally speaking, you're going to plan. 
And I'll give you one brief example uh, from 